Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, welcome to day two of our first Advanced HE conference, and it's great to see you all here. Uh, I think I really ought to start with um, the most probably important announcement of the day, which is um, if you were in the bar last night, you will have seen a bunch of people going through anguish, joy, pleasure, pain, a whole range of emotions, but absolutely delighted that England have got through to the quarterfinals. So, hooray! <laughs> I think that bodes very well for the rest of the conference, and let's hope they continue that streak. We had an absolutely fantastic day yesterday. We started off with a great uh, opening speech from Christine Jarvis. Uh, I attended a hugely uh, amusing and fun session on using humour in teaching and learning. And, and I know there are lots of other really great sessions, and I've had lots of uh, personal tweets and, and messages about what a great day it was. So I truly wish you the same experiences today. We had a session at the beginning yesterday about the global graduate and what does that mean? And particularly, what does that mean for teaching a global graduate? And when I thought about the number of people who have traveled many thousands of miles to be here from Australasia, Asia, the Middle East and Europe to join this conference and this truly global community, I thought actually what we do need is global teachers as a good starting point. So I think we have that here today. And I was also just so terribly impressed, because this is my first conference, to see the number of people so committed to their teaching practice and that continuous improvement of teaching practice, not just for themselves, but their students. So you're all in great company, and I wish you a very worthwhile day. We have over 400 sessions running over these three days, with over 500 presenters. We have posters, we have exhibitions, and I really invite you to max out as much as possible on all of the opportunities here, not least the networking. We will be having our famous debate. I say it's famous. It only happened for the first time last year, but it's already famous. The famous debate tonight over dinner or after dinner, which is this house believes that for the future of higher education to be truly global, education must be free for all. And that was something which we crowdsourced from our global community of fellows. So it's your choice, and I look forward to hearing what comes out of that. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, which is John Gill, stood here, the, the editor of The Times Higher. I'm sure he's a familiar face to many of you, uh, but just in case uh, you don't know John, he started there as a reporter in 2007. Um, and he became editor in 2012. And John has been a really strong influence on the, the development um, and the, the success of the Times Higher, and a very, very difficult time for such journals. Um, we're delighted that we're in partnership uh, with Times Higher. And John has been a real driving force in terms of the Thelmas, which is the Times Higher Leadership Management Awards, uh, which we recently celebrated and has grown that from strength to strength each year. He's also the personal judge on the University of the Year Award, which is one of the Times High's other prestigious awards. Um, the World Times High World Summit, he often speaks at that Times Higher Summit series. And so I think we're really, really honoured to have him here today. And he's going to talk to us about global HE trends. I think what it boils down to is what does the rapidly changing HE landscape look like and what does that mean in particular for the UK and our future prospects as a world leading system. But I do think what he presents uh, in terms of what's happening globally, because he's very well immersed in the data and what's happening around the globe, will be of benefit for all of you. I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave now because as a new organisation, Advance HE only merged on the 31st of March. Um, we happen to have a board meeting, so I've got to dash off to London, go to the board meeting, but I will be back for the debate and, and to catch up with you all later on. So have a fantastic day, everybody, and enjoy John. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Alison. <laughs> well... Thanks so much, Alison, for that kind introduction and for all the work that we, we do with all of you at Advance HE. It's um, a fantastic partnership, as Alison says, and something that we, we really value. So I'm highly delighted to be here with you um, giving this keynote. I really enjoyed those um, opening uh, housekeeping remarks as well. They were. Um, <laughs> we've had the, the penalty wins last night. We've had people clearly enjoying the conference so much they're breaking the doors down to get in. And um, we had a complete reverse of, of what we all know is true, that you should always ignore 
a male voice telling you to do something and always heed when a, a female voice tells you to do it. So that was great. Um, as Alison said, I, uh, one of the things that we do with Advance HE, which has been fantastic um, over many years uh, through the Leadership Foundation as one of the forerunner um, organizations of, of Advance HE, is the THE Leadership and Management Awards, which have been a fantastic uh, part of the, the diary for, for THE, but also for the sector for many years. And we did have uh, a really great event that I hope some of you were at uh, the week before last in London. Um, and I just wanted to reflect on that very briefly, because one of the things that I was pleased about when I was asked to come and give this keynote speech this morning is that um, I was before rather than, than after or up against the session that's coming up uh, later this morning on zombie performance pedagogy, because I knew that that was going to be an extremely tough, uh, tough gig to rival. And it occurred to me that as I sort of thought how I could open this session, looking, thinking back to the week before last after the Thelmas at, uh, at the Grosvenor House, there was a little bit of that the following morning. And, and here's a picture of me the morning after the Thelmas. Now, I'm, I'm actually really annoyed with myself because I had one of these done for Alison too. And then I chickened out of using it. I thought it was her conference. I can't do that. But she's left. So I, c I could have had Alison the zombie for you, but I'm afraid I don't. So uh, we'll move swiftly on. I just want to start by telling you a little bit about how THE has changed over the last few years. We have, um, as all of you have, have had to do, evolved a great deal because uh, the nature of certainly journalism and publishing is changing, but also the nature of higher education is becoming much, much more global, and that's where our audience increasingly sits. You will know us, many of you, as uh, a publication that's been around here in the UK for more than 40 years now. Um, that's actually the first ever edition of the THES, as it was then, um, with some quite famous bylines on it. Christopher Hitchens was a reporter on THE uh, back then. And you may not be able to see, but down at the bottom is his, his first story for THE, for which he was paid £4.32, uh, which is slightly more than we pay our journalists now. But, um, you know, other than that, everything has changed. It's, it's really uh, become a, very much a global publication looking at higher education uh, right around the world. And that's because of the nature of higher education changing very dramatically. So I just wanted to sort of start by reflecting on how much higher education there is out there. Uh, the world is clearly a very big place, and we think there are around 20,000 higher education institutions that you would recognize as universities. There are many more than that that are, are purely private, uh, what sometimes in Africa are known as teaching shops, you know, places without the rigor that you would really um, associate with a university. But we think there are 20,000 HEIs that uh, are involved in uh, teaching and research in, in a way that would be recognizable to all of you. And of those, around 5,000 are seriously research active. So this is the sort of pool that we're looking at at THE uh, when we think about global higher education. Um, two and a half thousand or so universities around the world publish more than 1,000 research papers over a five-year period. And that is the, uh, one of the criteria that we look at when we rank universities. You'll, I'm sure, be very familiar with the world university rankings that we publish. Um, we currently have data on about one and a half thousand universities, and we publish a ranking of just over 1,000. And one of the metrics that we use is that they have to have published more than 1,000 research papers over a five-year period. That's what we consider to be uh, sort of research active uh, universities. So that's how much higher education there is. Where is the higher education around the world? This is a, a map, a heat map, if you like. Um, the green is low density up to purple and blue, high density. And this is showing where world-ranked universities are. So we've plotted all 1,000 universities that we rank around the world. Um, the purples and blues are the strongest universities, the, those at the top of the rankings. Uh, the greens and yellows, obviously, um, weaker in terms of global competition. But you can see that, you know, as you would expect, North America, the US in particular, uh, UK and Europe uh, and Aust Australasia are, are really the sort of strong established systems. But we would say uh, that it's worth watching very closely um, Asia. And I'll come on to this, but China in particular is marching up the rankings in a really serious way. There's very strong competition coming through from, from, uh, from Asia, certainly from other parts of Southeast Asia, um, Hong Kong, Singapore, places like that. And we would expect the purples and blues uh, to be shifting, if anything, towards that part of the world over the next five to 10 years. In terms of THE, again, uh, just to sort of reflect how we've changed over the last few years, we now have offices in uh, the US, UK, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, um, Australia, and we have a, a correspondent who's not an office, but a, a full-time correspondent based in Berlin as well. So we're really trying to reflect 
higher education as it, uh, as it exists on a, on a global basis. And we do also work with universities um, to, to help them understand uh, the data behind the rankings. We're working with about 200 universities directly to, to, to really give them a, a strong understanding of the performance metrics that sit behind the, uh, behind the, the rankings themselves. Alison also mentioned our events. Um, this is uh, something that we, and I mentioned this really because Advance HE are a partner in this, this summit series that we put on right around the world. So we've been to Czech Republic, China, uh, Florida, um, we're off to Glasgow next week, and we hold these events right around the world. And, and most of the insights that I'm hoping to share with you today are drawn from those events where we get university leaders around a table in different parts of the world, a critical mass of universities from each region, and really understand what it is uh, they're up to. The rankings are, are hugely influential now globally, and I, th I thought it would be worth just briefly uh, running you through what our rankings constitute, because the data um, is perhaps a bit of a mystery to those of you that don't pay as much attention to it as we do. And broadly, um, the World University Rankings measure university performance on the basis of three different data sources. One is performance data that's submitted directly by universities. Universities work with us to tell us uh, all sorts of things, staff-student ratios, that sort of stuff. Um, and that comes directly through a portal. We also have reputation data. So every year we survey 10,000 research active academics around the world. Um, we weight that survey on UNESCO data based on where scholars are, the disciplines they're in, and all that sort of stuff. So we have what we think is really robust data on um, what scholars think the strongest universities are in their discipline in both teaching and research. And finally, bibliometric data, which we get from uh, Scopus, the Scopus database that Elsevier run. And in terms of numbers, you can see that about 1,500 universities submitted data to us last year for ranking. Um, 3,500 universities got votes in our reputation survey. And we analyzed 62 million citations from the Scopus database. So that's the sort of basis for the world rankings, which I think is really important for everybody to understand, because they are becoming ever more influential uh, as a sort of you know, indicator of performance for universities themselves, but also for governments, you know, deciding where funding is distributed and, and, and things like that. Right, I spent far too long uh, introducing THE to you, um, but I will move on now to some of the trends that we see uh, at, higher, uh, at THE as being particularly relevant to higher education, both here in the UK and around the world. And although I'm loath to mention the B word, uh, it's, it's worth getting out of the way early and, and mentioning Brexit, because the UK, I think, faces a very grave threat uh, in terms of its status as the the second most respected higher education system in the world after the US. And there are a number of reasons for that, and Brexit is only one of them, but I do think it's worth saying that whereas we are currently, by any measure, the second, most, the second highest performing uh, higher education sector in the world, it's got to be in some doubt whether that will still be the case in, say, 10 years' time. And I think some of the threats that we face are obviously the flow of international students. We're a highly internationalized sector here in the UK, which is a great strength, and it's something that we, we do measure and, and, uh, and monitor in the, in the rankings as well. Um, but the flow of international students, both from outside the EU and from within the EU, has to be in some doubt as a result of Brexit. Partly this will, is because of specific changes around visas, and there was some good news this week. You may have seen that uh, the Home Office has announced that uh, the first cohort of EU students who will be coming through into the UK system the first year after, after Brexit uh, will be treated as domestic students. They will continue to have access to loans and so on um, in, in, the, in the usual way, and that that will be protected throughout their time at, at university. But whether that will be allowed to continue in the long term has to be in some doubt, and I think that's a huge risk both to um, the nature of UK universities and student experience and teaching and learning and all those things, but also, of course, to revenues as they are very, very important to uh, universities' financial health. Um, in terms of academic talent, I think it's worth saying that I'm sure this is true at all of your universities. We are already seeing plenty of anecdotal evidence, not only of scholars leaving the UK because of Brexit, although there are examples of that, but actually perhaps more uh, significant people deciding not to come. Um, there are lots of uh, examples of really very um, respected senior scholars who had been intending to come and, and, and work here in the UK deciding that it's not the place for them. And whether that's because of doubts over continued access to Horizon Europe, which is the big uh, European research funding program, or whether it's just a sense of the UK being a diminishing force in the world and in higher education, 
uh, it's clearly happening and something that we have to be watching very, very closely. And from a rankings perspective, I would expect uh, Brexit to have a significant uh, negative impact on the UK's performance in rankings over the coming years. The graph that I put up there is just a, uh, an early warning, really, about how significant Brexit could be in terms of research, because this is uh, a graph showing how the, the, the proportion of Horizon 2020 projects coordinated by teams in different countries, and the UK has always led that graph. The UK has always been the number one recipient of Horizon 2020 senior grants. Last year, for the first time, you'll see that the UK fell below Germany in terms of the number of uh, really big, prestigious European research grants that it was, that it was leading. Um, and that's an early warning of, of what could be coming down the road. I know this conference is about teaching, but I do think that it's worth reflecting a bit further on, on the research picture because it's really a reflection of international competitiveness. Certainly what most of the, it's the easiest thing to measure, frankly. It's much harder, as you know, to measure teaching quality, but research is a really clear measure of international competitiveness. And this is um, the, uh, the most recent uh, senior grants dished out by the European Research Council about a month or two ago. Now, there's some good news in here. You'll see that the UK, to the left of this graph, is by some distance the largest recipient. 66 uh, ERC senior grants were given to UK-based teams. Um, they're worth about £2.5 million pounds each, so really significant flows of money into the UK through this route. Um, and you'll see that, that Germany, which is next to it, only got 42. Um, that's a significant improvement on the previous year. The graph that I showed you just now, showing the UK dipping below Germany, uh, was from the previous year's grants. So it does suggest that after that initial dip, after Brexit, there's some return to the strength of the UK system uh, and some faith in the UK system that goes beyond any sort of European... Uh, disquiet or dislike about Brexit. The, the support for European science and research still seems to be coming through, um, but we will have to watch this very, very closely. Um, this is a, another um, view of the ERC grants, and it's just showing you how many of these grants are uh, given to people in different countries who are not from that country. So if you look at the UK, 66 grants there to the left. All the light green grants at the top um, are projects that are led by British scientists. Um, the rest of them below are either uh, European nationals, non-UK, who are based here and, and working in our universities, and the dark green at the bottom are um, the rest of the world. And you can see that sort of 23, 24 of those 66 grants, so perhaps a third, are being led by um, international scientists who are working here in the UK. And this will be something that you're very familiar with, I know, um, in your own universities, just how international we are as a sector. I'd like to talk briefly now about international student uh, mobility. Um, you all know the long-term global trends. It's just been going up and up and up and up and up. And it's become hugely important both to, um, I think, the culture of universities and the culture of classrooms. Um, and the prospects that graduates have when they go on and, and leave university in terms of understanding uh, the global nature of work now, having, having studied alongside students from all around the world, but also, as I mentioned earlier, to, to, to university revenues. Um, you know, vice chancellors might not like to, like to admit it, but this is one of the very few taps that universities can turn in terms of funding, uh, because the UK has been very good at... Um, uh, at, at exploiting sounds like a bad word, but exploiting the demand that there is uh, for, for students for British degrees. And you can see there that uh, in terms of the number of, of students, this is total global movement of students around the world. Um, from 1975 down here in, in the left-hand corner where there was less than a million students traveling outside of their country of or origin to study, in 2015 it was up four and a half, getting on for five million. So huge numbers of students uh, traveling around the world. Um, now, in terms of where they're going, again, I would just like to make the point that the UK is one of those countries that has absolutely capitalized on this. The UK over here uh, is obviously one of the very international systems. The US is just next to the UK. You can see that uh, although it has a highly in internationalized PhD cohort, which is the darkest green column, in terms of masters and bachelors, which are the other two next to it, much, much uh, smaller proportions of their students are, are from, it, from overseas. The UK has something like, getting on for 40% of its PhD students coming from around the world, uh, something like 
33, a third, a third of all uh, master students, and it's getting on for around 15% of, uh, of, of uh, undergraduate students also uh, coming from around the world. Now, the other flags that I put there just uh, reflect the fact that most highly internationalized systems are very, very small. So Switzerland, New Zealand, Japan, uh, actually, sorry, Japan is an example of a very um, uninternationalized sector, very inward looking, it hasn't really capitalized on this at all, but Switzerland, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Singapore, places like this that don't have strong domestic talent pools tend to tap into global markets. That makes absolute sense. The UK, of course, does have a very strong domestic talent pool, but has still internationalized far more than many of its rivals. The only other country that has done that to a similar degree to the UK in terms of the established systems is Australia. Where are these students coming from? Um, China. China has now overtaken the EU in terms of the total number of students from outside the UK studying here. Um, and I think that's really, really significant. Um, if you look at where, uh, where sort of universities are, are getting, their, getting their income from, this is largely because of the switch to, from state grants to fees in the domestic scene, but also in terms of the international. Something like uh, half of all UK universities now get two-thirds of their total income from fees. Uh, so they rely on this to an absolutely huge degree. And you'll see uh, that the, the yellow line, which is up, sort of overtaking the, the black line up there, that's China overtaking Europe in terms of the total number of, of uh, international students coming here. And there are, of course, some really big risks to this. Brexit is one very obvious risk to the international flows. The funding review that's currently underway is another. Um, you know, will we have some sort of variable fee system forced on the sector that will fundamentally affect uh, how universities can recruit students, the mix of disciplines that they can offer on a competitive basis. You know, that's all up for grabs at the moment. Um, on the domestic front, I think the TEF is another potential issue. We have yet to see, I think, you may disagree, but I think we've yet to see really how the TEF will, flow out, will, will play out in terms of uh, reshaping demand from both home students and international students whether they will be paying very close attention. As I walked into Aston's campus this morning, I saw a huge sign saying, you know, gold TEF. Um, is that going to fundamentally matter to a Chinese student that's looking where to study? I think we, that remains to be seen. Uh, the visa regime is a fourth area that I think fundamentally puts this flow of international students at risk. Um, although the government has always said there's no cap on international students, coming here, the reality we know is that they have put a very tight squeeze on uh, visas being issued uh, for, for higher education and that Theresa May has really been the driver of that. So as long as she's in power, I think it's unlikely that we'll see some significant liberalization of the visa regime. Um, and then there are some other sort of things that you just have, there's nothing we can do about them, but currency fluctuations. Uh, one of the very few silver linings of Brexit was um, that the, uh, the decline in the value of the pound actually made the UK quite a cheap place to study. Um, so, you know, that, that was a good thing from a point of view of a, a Chinese or Indian student thinking about studying here. But those currency fluctuations can, can change very quickly. And of course, the sixth area that I'd flag in terms of the threat to the UK's share of this market is global competition, which is ramping up all the time, both from countries like Canada, where um, the, 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 the Prime Minister has made a very explicit pitch to the world to say, if the UK with Brexit and if the US with Trump isn't interested in having the best academic talent coming to its universities, then Canada would love to have you. And, and there are countries like that that absolutely could start to eat our lunch. Uh, and then there are also countries such as China that are significantly improving their domestic provision and that will also uh, start to, to threaten uh, the global share that, that, we can, that we can get our hands on. I won't... Uh, spend too long on this slide. This is just to make the point about how quickly um, different student flows can change. The li Greece used to be the, the, the largest sender of international students to the UK. Back in the mid-90s, it sent more students here than any other. It was about 20,000 students coming from Greece, I think. Um, and if you think, if there are any pulp fans in the room, that line in uh, the song Common People, she came from Greece, she had a thirst for knowledge, she studied sculpture at St. Martin's College. That was obviously a real case study because huge numbers of international students were coming from Greece. <laughs> it, it just doesn't happen anymore. Um, you know, they, and that's because of the financial collapse in Greece, uh, 
not as much money to spend, whereas China now sends 80,000 students, so four times as many as Greece ever sent here. So it can change very, very quickly. Thinking about uh, UK study visas, I think this is quite an interesting comparison of the, uh, the, the top graph here is, is um, the total number of, of study visas issued to um, Chinese students uh, over a period from 2005 to 2016. Uh, the, the graph below, exactly the same time period, it's the, the proportion of study visas issued to Indian students. Um, and what you can see there is China just growing and growing and growing, and India absolutely crashing in 2009. And a couple of things happened in 2009. One was the financial crash, and one was a big squeeze on post-study work visas. Uh, and this shows how both the global economic situation and specific policy decisions can really have a very significant direct impact on the flow of students from a particular country. And, and I think this is interesting because there's two different models for financing higher education for students coming from these two countries. So a Chinese student will typically uh, have you know, grandparents and parents who've saved up a lot of money. The rising middle classes have, have growing affluence. All that money flowing down to a single child who uh, all the hopes and fears of that family are invested in and they're sent off to the UK to, to study at Aston and get a wonderful degree. Um, and it's all paid for in cash, essentially. So the financial crash will have had a bit of an impact, but, but not a huge, a huge impact. India, very different model, and very often students from India will be coming here to study um, on the basis of bank loans that they're taking out themselves to pay for the international fees over here, which, as you know, are very significant. Now, the minute that there's a financial crash and the minute that the UK tightens up its post-study work visa system, uh, a student in those circumstances will be thinking, A, it's suddenly become very, very expensive for me, uh, B, the... The, the outlook in terms of my job prospects now that the, the, what the global economy has crashed isn't so great. And C, the chances of getting a job in the UK, which is probably higher paying and, and will allow me to repay that bank loan, uh, has just been shut off to me. So suddenly you see visas absolutely crash. And we're in a situation now, extraordinarily, where Germany actually um, has more Indian students studying uh, over there than the UK does, which considering the historic links and, and, and the proportion that we used to have going back to sort of 15 years uh, ago is really significant. I've been banging on about um, how international the UK is, and I just wanted to give you some, some data from, it's from our own data set that, that powers the THE World University Rankings that illustrates that. Um, I'm showing you three different metrics here. So there's purple, blue, and green, and each one is a, a comparison of the UK on the left with the rest of the world to the right. These are box, box and whiskers plots, which I will try to briefly explain to those of you that don't know wh what they are. This is essentially a distribution of, um, of, uh, of, the, of the, all the universities in our rankings. And what you have is the box in the middle is the middle 50% of the distribution. The line through the middle of that box is the median, uh, and then the whiskers are the rest of the distribution. So you're really looking at where that line is to get the median score for a university in the UK and a median score for the rest of the world uh, in terms of each of the indicators that we're looking at. And what we're looking at here is, in, is proportion of international students on the left, proportion of international staff in the middle, and proportion of internationally co-authored research papers on the right. And in each of these, you can see that the UK median is massively above the average for the rest of the world. So this just makes the point that whether it's students, staff, or research collaboration, which are the three things we measure in the World University Rankings as being uh, you know, the things that make a, a university international in a, in a powerful way, the UK is massively outperforming the rest of the world. So it just sort of re-emphasizes the point that I've been making uh, throughout. I want to talk a little bit now about the global competition that we face, because I think uh, it's quite easy for the UK to underestimate or, or ignore or, or just not notice what's going on in some other parts of the world. Um, this is a, a graph showing the total research output of some different countries. So the total number of papers that they produce every year from 2006 up to 2016. Uh, and would anyone like to guess who's leading, who's top dog here? Who produces the most research in the world? Which country? US, yeah, some, United States. Absolutely right. They're, they're top dog. They have been for as long as anyone would care to remember. But uh, what you can see, uh, if I just 
flag up the, um, the key to this is that China, again, this is a, a recurring theme I know, is very, very rapidly catching up. Uh, and we think that um, China, which is already, uh, well, I think by 2019, it's going to be the biggest spender in, in terms of R&D in the world, although not, I should add, the biggest spender in terms of basic science. Um, we think China will overtake uh, the US in terms of total scholarly output within the next five years, which is a really extraordinary thing. Um, how are they doing it? Well, funding. China's putting huge, huge sums of money into higher education. And many of you will have been over there and seen it yourselves. Um, but actually, it's extraordinary to go and visit some of these universities. Uh, we, we had an event in Shenzhen at, at Suztech, which is just over the, uh, the water from Hong Kong. It's sort of the Chinese Silicon Valley. And the, the sheer sums of money that are going into everything there, estates, laboratories, uh, research grants. Um, this is uh, a graph showing the growth in um, funding being distributed by just one of China's research funding councils, the National Natural Science Foundation of China. And you can see that it's, it's grown 360 times in the last 30 years, which is pretty extraordinary. They're now distributing about 3.5 billion or 3.2 billion pounds, uh, which is what, roughly half the total budget of UK Research Council, something like that, and this is just one of their research councils. So they really are on the march. But it's not just, I talked about scholarly output, and you might think it's just quantity, not quality, that China's uh, improving on. Not so. Uh, this graph shows you uh, how various of the elite research groupings fare in terms of the the number of journal articles that actually rank in the top 1% of, uh, of citation. So the most cited journal papers that are being produced in the world. Who's producing them? Ivy League still leads the pack here, but you can see that the Ivy League is dipping, and most of that slack is being brought up by the red line there, the C9, which is essentially the, the Chinese uh, Russell Group, if you like. Our Russell Group, you'll see, is in yellow holding its own pretty well, starting to fall away a little bit as China, China rises. But again, this just makes the point that China is absolutely on the march when it comes to research. To return briefly to the question of scale, I think it's worth re-emphasizing just how enormous these Asian giants are. Um, if you look at the estimated enrollments in China and in India in 2020, 37 million undergraduates enrolling in China in a single year, 27 million enrolling in India. Um, I think what this shows us is that people often think the, uh, the flow of students out of these countries is going to dry up the minute that they get really good universities of their own. That's not going to happen. Uh, the scale is just too big. You know, they have some absolutely brilliant universities, particularly in China, and as I say, they're really rising up the prestige rankings. But just the sheer number of students means that there will always be demand for uh, those at the top end of, of the sort of quality threshold, if you like, to go and study uh, at universities around the world. They're not suddenly going to have the capacity to teach all of these students uh, at the level that they want to be taught at within their own countries. So I think that's one uh, positive that we can uh, take if we're thinking about um, the continued flow of, of students here to the UK. I think the other thing is to say that they are continuing to grow. So the, this uh, bar chart here is it's slightly, it's not the clearest, but what it's essentially showing you is that over the next 10 years, between now and 2027, uh, China will have uh, 250,000 more students each year than they, than they currently do by 2027. So they'll have 1 point, I think it's 1.5 million students Going, in, going abroad to study by uh, 2027. And in India, it's going to increase from about 250,000 currently to about 440,000. So that flow of students out of these countries, places like Australia, the UK, US, can, can, can sort of you know, go and continue to attract those students, is going to continue. I'd also like to throw in a few caveats. It's probably easy for us to... Uh, wring our hands about the state of things, uh, certain things here in the UK, and think that you know, we're the only one with problems. Uh, certainly not the case. And there are some caveats to this sort of Asian miracle uh, in terms of their higher education um, improvements. Not least graduate employment. Um, so if you take South Korea, which is a, a very successful, very developed system, 
Um, they've got big, big problems in terms of the supply of graduates into a job market and the demand for those graduates in terms of, of, of positions available. So half a million young people are entering the job market there every year with a degree, uh, and only around 200,000 jobs are available for them. So there's a, a really high uh, graduate unemployment rate, um, in fact, the highest since, uh, since the turn of, of the millennium. Um, and it's something they're really grappling with. South Korea, it's also worth mentioning, has um, a big demographic problem coming because they have, I think, one of the lowest birth rates in the world. It's something like 1.1 children per couple or something like that. And um, they can see a, a time when actually they're going to have far too many universities for the number of young people coming through. Uh, to the extent that actually we ran a story recently in, in THE talking to various um, university presidents in South Korea saying that they were really looking forward to the reunification with North Korea because they get a whole load more students coming down to, to fill the empty seats. <laughs> it's not the main benefit of reunification, but it's one. <laughs> India as well, um, big problems there. I mentioned these sort of low quality sort of teaching shops that some countries uh, India certainly and certain African countries are, are, are grappling with the for-profit sector that is, is really you know, make, making huge amounts of money but not delivering quality. EY did a, a report relatively recently looking at Indian higher education over the next decade, 10 to 15 years, uh, and came to the conclusion that half of all graduates coming out of universities in India are not employable in any sector based on industry standards of employability. So that's uh, not great. China. Um, China also has a graduate unemployment problem, uh, an unemployment rate of about 16%. Uh, the graduate premium, premium is in decline. Uh, again, you know, there are, there are real problems with the, the sheer number. You saw the numbers, 37 million people enrolling uh, on degree courses there. And there are some, some big plans by the government there to, to, to turn some of the lower performing universities into vocational schools, for example. Um, However, that is counterbalanced by a huge investment program in China, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, uh, called the Double First Class Project, which is absolutely funneling vast sums of money into top-ranking universities between now and 2050 uh, to try and just increase the proportion of those that make it to the very top of the rankings. And places like Peking and Tsinghua are already doing that. They're already you know, really quite high up in, in the rankings and will continue to, to, to increase. There are now seven... Chinese universities in the world top 200, and two, the two I mentioned up there in the top 100. Uh, and as I say, they're, they're investing vast sums of money um, in uh, both uh, basic science uh, and R&D more generally. And when it's, it's interesting, when we had our event in, in Shenzhen and uh, the president of Peking came to, came to speak at it, and he was very open about tr going out to try and poach the really talented diaspora of Chinese academics who exist uh, in many of the Western systems, so the UK, US in particular. Many Chinese students will have gone there to study, uh, done post-grad, post-docs. They'll now be really productive mid-career academics, you know, firing on all cylinders. And places like Peking are coming in for those people and saying, come back to Peking, you'll get bigger salary, um, bigger lab. You'll run the lab rather than being second or third in command. Um, and they're, they're, they're being very successful in actually attracting that diaspora back. So um, those elite Chinese universities are really on the march, as I say. Uh, I just want to talk briefly about the US. Um, I do want to leave 10 minutes for, for Q&A, but um, we, we, we launched a, uh, a ranking with the Wall Street Journal. This is the, the first year we did it, the year before last which we're really pleased about. The Wall Street Journal is the, 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 it's the largest newspaper in the US by circulation, so this is an instant sort of platform for us in America, which is, which is fantastic. But what, it's, what we're trying to do there is measure, measure um, not just research performance, but teaching quality. And next week in Glasgow, uh, at the Teaching Excellence Summit that we're holding, which Alison is coming to speak at as well, and which Advance HE are a partner for, um, we will be launching a, a parallel ranking to this THE WSJ ranking, for Europe, which will start to look at teaching metrics and specifically student engagement. We've done a very large survey of student engagement. Um, and this is really disruptive for the THE rankings model because up until now, as I say, we've tended to focus on research performance because it's easy to measure. We're starting to look much more at teaching quality, student engagement, the value add, all those things that I know will be very important to people in this room. Um, so it's a model that we're really excited about and, and hope you'll, 
you'll follow closely. The US is still top dog for now, um, but as I say and have, have mentioned several times, there are problems in the US. Um, one is affordability, huge affordability crisis in, in the US. If you think that we've got problems here in the UK with £9,000 fees and all the angst that there is about um, student debt, uh, go over to America and, 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 and get a feel for what's, you know, the, the affordability issues there. This is a, a graph. The, the, the line in pink is um, state expenditure as a, as a, uh, a proportion of um, state budgets on um, public higher education from 1980 up to uh, five, five years or so ago. Um, the line in blue is state spending as a proportion of state budgets on their prisons. And you'll see that in about 2008, uh, America switched to spending more on its prisons than it did on its public universities, uh, which is really sad because, you know, the public universities have been huge engines of social mobility in America, and the whole sort of American dream of, you know, put in the effort and, and you'll get the reward has been built around uh, institutions like those public universities, which have absolutely been lifting people up and out of poverty and, 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 and giving them the opportunities that, uh, that America has always prided itself on. But, but state, as I say, state spending on public uh, higher education is really, really in decline in a big way. This makes the point by comparing Stanford with Berkeley, two very close neighbors in, in, in uh, San Francisco. Um, but you can see that uh, if you look at um, the, the, the tuition, the third line down is tuition fees charged to in-state undergraduates, 45,000 per year at Stanford, 13,000 at Berkeley. Uh, and that's in, in major decline. And one of the things that um, has, is really striking about Berkeley, which is really this sort of iconic uh, figurehead of public higher education in the US, is that if you look at uh, their budgets in 2004, which really isn't that long ago in the lifetime of a university, you know, a little over a decade ago, a third of Berkeley's uh, funding came from direct from state coffers. That now stands around 10%. So it's really gone off a cliff uh, over just a, a sort of 10 or 12 year period. Um, and whereas in the UK there has clearly been a switch in terms of where university funding is coming from too, that switch has by and large been made up with a, an increase in tuition fee income, picking up the slack where uh, public funding has fallen away. And that hasn't happened in, 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 uh, in California where the state government has forced a, a tuition fee freeze on university. So a really big, uh, big problem. This is another graph just making the point about affordability. This shows in blue um, credit card debt, total credit card debt uh, in the US, in red student loan debt. So far, far higher uh, total student loan debt than credit card debt. They, the two crossed in about 2010. Um, and student loan debt is now the second highest consumer debt category in America behind only mortgage debt. Um, I think there are now more than 44 million Americans owing $1.3 trillion. And the average student in the class of 2016 had $37,000 in student loan debt. So it's really, really significant. I'm going to skip over this just so uh, I leave a bit of time for Q&A. But um, this was really just going to make the point very briefly that uh, if you look at where this is pub public versus private, in terms of finances and public versus private in terms of a student inclusion metric. All I was going to show with this is that, again, the public universities are playing with much lower resources but doing much more of the heavy lifting in terms of public social inclusion and lifting people out of poverty. I'm going to end by um, talking very briefly about another problem that America has, which is a diversity issue. Does anyone have any uh, thoughts about what these three men have in common? There's no, no reason why you should. They've all been Harvard president. That's one thing they have in common. Uh, they're all men. That's another thing. They're all white. But there's something else which I found really extraordinary, which is that they're all called Larry. <laughs> um, Larry ba Bacow, Larry Summers, and Larry Lau. Larry Bacow is the current Harvard president. Uh, over there on the right. And what this means is that there are more Harvard presidents called Larry <laughs> and indeed Samuel, John, Charles, Edward and James than there are women who have led Harvard. 
has been just one, Drew Faust. And it makes you wonder whether Drew, they thought he was, it was Andrew until they appointed him. <laughs> it's possible. But it really shows you that, you know, as, uh, as much as we might lionize America as being the sort of land of opportunity and, and so on, uh, it, it does have many of the problems that we face here in the UK. Uh, many of the issues that, that universities face are global issues. Um, you're all essentially doing the same thing, teaching, research, doing your best to, to deliver graduates with an education that really transforms their lives. Um, and many of these issues I know will be specific to the universities that I've touched on, but I hope that gives you a sense of some of the trends that we see going on around the world that we think are interesting, that we think have a relevance to UK universities or indeed Australian or American or wherever you happen to come from. Um, and I'm very happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, thank you very much, John. I think um, that's put a real context around um, our subject for these three days in learning from those global communities and, and sharing our practice across them. Um, but before we move into a lot of workshops and sessions where we can actually share detailed practice with each other and with our global colleagues and delegates here, um, any questions for John? I think we've got a couple of roving mics. There's a question down here. If there's Thanks very much. That was a very interesting um, uh, presentation, and it really is helpful to sort of drill down and work out where you know what goes behind these rankings. So thank you very much f um, for that very easily <laughs> digestible <laughs> approach to that. Um, I'm interested in thinking about your teaching excellence um, rankings, which is a fabulous idea, and it's really great to see Times Higher engaging with that. Um, I think my question is, where does scholarship of teaching and learning fit into that? We know about the research metrics and how citations have really, you know, really pushed those research rankings across. Mm. Um, and I just never hear anything around scholarship of teaching and learning for those of us who are teaching focused mm. and who are really um, working with student engagement, but also, um, you know, really systematically engaging with scholarship and research around that area, just not when we're in education schools. Yeah, and, and I think um, the problem with rankings that, that we find, and this is particularly true of, of global rankings, to a certain extent domestic rankings can, can be more, more laser focused on data sets that exist within a particular country, and that still can be very difficult to do, but it's easier to do. The problem with international rankings is the minute that you say we're going to measure this across the world, you have to pick up on data sets that are genuinely global, because otherwise you know, the, the whole exercise is, is kaput. Now, what we're trying to do with teaching, because it's very, very difficult to do that with, with teaching rankings uh, for, for the world, we're trying to start with specific countries. So, we've, as I say, Wall Street Journal was just the US. The Europe rankings are looking at, uh, it's not even the whole of, the whole of Europe, it's a dozen or so uh, countries within, within Europe. Uh, now, we don't have anything uh, measuring scholarship of teaching. I wish we did. Um, this is very much a first stab for us. And when the rankings come out next week, I'll be really interested to see um, people's reaction to them because there may well be some surprises in there, some omissions, some things where you look at and think, actually, I don't agree with that. It doesn't make sense. Uh, and we want to improve on that. This is very much year one. And this is actually how we've tended to develop rankings over the years. You publish, you get the reaction. People come in and say, well, actually, you could be doing this better. And I've got a brilliant idea for how you could measure X, Y, or Z. I completely agree with you. If there was a way for us to touch on... Uh, scholarship of teaching, and indeed the interaction of research and teaching, which is not quite your question, I know, but it is, I think, really important. Research-informed teaching, what does that actually look like? How do you measure that? Is it delivering good teaching, isn't it? Which, funnily enough, is the topic of um, Times Higher's cover story this Thursday. So I'd love to say it's available in all good news agents, but it isn't. <laughs> but you can subscribe. Um, so we have explored that issue in some depth in, in THE this week. Completely agree with you um, that it would be something that we would love, to, uh, love to, to measure. And if you've got ideas, please do talk to us. You know, the, the data team, we've got about a dozen or so data scientists working for THG now who are thinking about this stuff all the time and really would, you know, welcome and value your, your direct engagement on any ideas that you have around that. Hi, thank you for the keynote. Um, I was interested in the fact that gender balance is part of the measures 
so the faculty and student gender balance. And I work at an arts university and I teach fashion. And most of our students, as you may be able to guess, are female. So I just wondered you know, what the implications of that are in terms of the measurement. In terms of the rankings, well, again, in terms of the world rankings, we don't look at gender balance. But in terms of the, um, these teaching rankings, these, these more student-focused rankings, we do. Um, and you'll do very well, is the short answer, because we tend to, we tend to say uh, that... Um, Anything close, well, I think we, the, the way we actually measure it is a 50% is an ideal uh, ratio in terms of the, the student makeup um, and indeed the academic makeup. Um, now, in many, many uh, university courses, it's nowhere near that. It's, 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 it's you know, split the other way. Um, should we be measuring gender balance as a significant indicator? Um, at the moment, we don't. We have a relatively small proportion of the school being delivered uh, on that basis because, as I say, they tend to be much more focused on um, outputs such as, uh, well, the obvious ones being research outputs uh, and now with the new teaching rankings, graduate outputs such as salaries, we try and do a value-add score, all that sort of stuff. But I think for us, it was really important in these new rankings that when we're trying to innovate, we're trying to do things that... There are lots of ranking, rankings organisations out there all basically doing the same stuff, measuring the same stuff because it's easy. I think it's really important for us uh, to try and pick up on some of these things that are important to universities, important to the student experience, and which don't currently get measured. So, again, I mean, this is a slightly uh, weaselly answer, but year one... We're looking at this. I'm not sure we'd have got it right. Do look at the results when they come through next week and let us know if you think that what we're measuring is not actually delivering the correct outcomes in terms of the ranking. Because, again, we would really like to say this is a starting point. Year two, we can and will do better. What have we got right? What have we got wrong? What can we improve on? So it's really um, a wait and see. I, I don't actually know how it will have a direct impact. I suspect that you would do, you would do well out of that particular metric, but um, I would like to have a look at that and ask you to come back with feedback in uh, two weeks' time. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I was really struck or oh, interested in the kind of notion of sort of marketisation in higher education and wondered if, you know, from, from the figures that you put up, whether this is experienced differently across the globe. So, for example, is China, you know, China is still more of a kind of state-focused um, kind of um, approach. And, and what impacts that might have on terms of the student experience, that, that kind of differentiated sort of marketisation uh, uh, across the globe? Yeah, and I think um, it, you're right. Marketisation has played out very differently in different countries. So, in the US, we, we have these very... Uh, you know, rich, elite, private universities that are highly marketised, of course, but, have, but they've also got this very unique philanthropic uh, income flow that allows them to sort of, you know, be uh, blind, uh, uh, knees blind admissions, and the sticker price looks astronomical, but very few people actually pay it, and so on and so forth. So at that end, uh, you can say that it's, it's played reasonably well. Then you have the publics where um, they're desperately trying to marketise because the money's not coming from state coffers anymore. They're doing things like striking big, you know, sponsorship deals with... I was at Berkeley recently, and they've done a huge sponsorship deal with Under Armour, which is a big um, sports equipment company, just to try and bring... And they're sort of, you know, it's all, all linked to the football team and so on. They're desperately trying to bring more uh, income from private sources into the system and not doing it terribly well. Um, I think in terms of the, the systems that have marketised in a, in, a, in a fairly straightforward way, Australia and, and the UK are the obvious examples, um, and then you've got places like Europe that really haven't. Now, in terms of the rankings performance, probably marketisation has been a reasonably good thing in terms of pushing your universities up, up the scale. Um, Europe has really languished, so Europe has a system that is typically... Uh, academics are employed as civil servants and uh, it's very underperforming in terms of research strength. Now again, they are starting to take some of the lessons from uh, systems like the UK and implement them. So there's a huge merger process going on in, in the Parisian universities, for example, to try and model what some of the bigger UK universities are doing in terms of critical mass and all that sort of stuff. But they don't have the fee structure and the fee system. Um, I think the 
I think the short answer is that the, there's no obvious single way to finance higher education. I think the, the trend is very much away from funding coming direct from government, and that will continue. Uh, I think the income contingent student loan system, which was first developed in Australia and then has been uh, most successfully uh, rolled out here in the UK, has been probably the most sustainable system. And certainly if you, if you look at sort of World Bank studies, people like Jamil Salmi and OECD, they're always very, very positive about the income contingent system as a, as a sustainable model. Uh, the fly in the ointment is that obviously the government is potentially tearing that up and, and thinking about doing something completely different because we thought the fee system had been sort of settled for a generation and then Jeremy Corbyn uh, said that um, he'd scrap them all together. Lots of people voted for it and, um, and Theresa May's had a panic. Now, I think the funding, funding review that, that's due to report this autumn will be really, really fascinating. Whether they just tweak around the edges, uh, which arguably wouldn't actually give the, the, the Conservative Party an answer to the Corbyn free, free education uh, offer, or whether they do something really fundamental remains to be seen. But I think that could be a, a bit of a watershed moment for the future of the marketised system as we know it. You know, will the government row back from that in a really significant way? That's what I think will be interesting this year. Hi, Adam Shaw, Liverpool Business School. Hi. Um, just picking up on that government point, what role do you think you play as Times Higher then to influence and, and um, affect policy and, and government when you're showing this picture of what a large international market we, we play, um, particularly thinking about review, particularly thinking about the concept that they might be turning or moving some subjects back into FE is, is being talked about. If you move, for example, business in, into FE, how does that have an impact on, on that international market? Uh, and what role do you play as, as yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think our role as a sort of independent media organisation is to reflect what, what uh, our readers, all of, all of you, are saying and what, you know, what, what the concerns of universities are. And, and obviously we do that week in, week out. I think the bigger issue that we can, that we can uh, the bigger influence we can perhaps bring to bear a different influence is through the rankings and I think there's really clear uh, if, if the UK is concerned about the UK about this country's place in the world which it certainly should be and I think is with with Brexit looming and the idea that the UK doesn't have huge numbers of, of crown jewels that it can sort of uh, you know really burnish in the post Brexit world universities are clearly one of them and I think we've been very clear, and we have gone and seen ministers and spoken to the department uh, at some length uh, on, the, on the rankings data to show how fundamentally uh, the UK's strength is based on being a really networked, integrated international system. And I think we're banging that drum very, very hard. So when we see uh, things like, we had a, a, a splash in the magazine a few weeks ago about Oxford, uh, an Oxford academic from China going back to China because although she'd got a visa to stay here and do her really groundbreaking research, her 22-month-old baby had not got a visa and had been t told it had to stay in China, so she very sensibly went home. You know, things like that, we will bring to bear certainly the full weight of our journalism, but actually hammering home that this has a very real impact in terms of the, the, the comparative performance of UK universities in terms of rankings, which, which actually governments do care about rankings. You know, we see this right around the world. Lots of governments are building whole funding programs, excellence initiatives, they tend to call them, on, on cranking up their performance within the rankings, and they're paying off. And I think it's only a matter of time before the UK realises that, you know, post-Brexit, its universities are one of the very few things that really do hold such a stellar position in the world. And um, I'm confident that uh, universities will, you know, over the next decade, uh, continue to be both strong, both international, but also... Uh, to be a bit of a centrepiece for the UK and for government policy. I do think this government is starting to understand how important they are. Okay, thank you very much, Good. John. Thank you very much.